Well, hey, Grove family. Aren't we excited for Serve Week? Wow. Um, I can't wait for God to write more stories in our community as we get to serve uh, just the city of Riverside and give all the glory to God. That starts next Sunday, and we're so excited. Um, but if we haven't met yet, my name is Grantham. I get to serve on staff here. And whether you're joining us in the worship center, online, or you're even braving the heat in the courtyard, uh, we're just so happy that you're worshiping with us today. Um, if this is your first time, we would love to just invite you to fill out a Connect card. You can find this online or in your bulletin, and you can drop it in the offering boxes or bring it to Guest Central after service. We would just love uh, to meet you and just to get to hear your story. Uh, we have some exciting announcements um, and some fun celebrations happening in the life of our church. Uh, the first one is we have volunteer appreciation happening on Wednesday, August 9th. We're super excited about that. And also, can we believe that that's only two and a half weeks away? It's crazy. Uh, summer is coming to a close. Um, but if you've served with us this past year or you want to volunteer in this coming year, then this night is for you. And then on that same weekend, we have August, on August 12th and 13th, we get to honor our educators. And, and we're really excited about that. We want our educators to know that, that God sees all of the hard work that they do and that we want to just come alongside of them as a church and support them and pray for them. So we're really excited to honor our educators. And if you have any more questions or you want to look at some more announcements, you can find them in your bulletin and you can sign up for any of these events on the Grove um, dot cc slash register. Uh, but that being said, let's do what we came to do, right? Let's stand and let's get ready to worship. Praise the Lord, everybody. Is there anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord one more time to give a great praise to a great God? Let's clap our hands all over the room like this, church. Come on. Yeah. I was buried beneath my shame. Yeah. Who could carry that kind of weight? Yeah. It was my tomb till I met you. Yeah. Help me sing it, church. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures and all my failures. I tried to hide. Oh, it was my tomb till I met you. Oh, you call my name. Here we go. I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day.
Now I love this next part, church. It simply says that I needed rescue because my sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of his glory. So let's sing it together. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of... Here we go, say! When I was broken, you were my key.
your worship and let's lift this together. tonight, God, our, our hallelujah, our highest praise, because you are worthy of it tonight. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay of the goodness of God. Come on, can we stretch our hands and let's sing it together. In all my life of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. Uh, you have led me. You have led me through the fire. Darkest night. The darkest night. You are close like no other. I love it. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend.
Come on, church, let's give him praise tonight. We will surely sing of your goodness forever and forevermore. God, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you adoration. We give you glory. Your goodness is truly chasing after us, and it's running after us. And so we're thankful that even in our faithless days, you've been a faithful God. And so, God, we, as we continue in the service, we pray that you would just continue to rest on the hearts of your people and continue to do the work only you can do. We honor you, we praise you, and it's in your precious son, Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say amen. Say amen one more time, church. Come on. Here, before you take your seats, can you turn to your right, to your left, your front and back? Greet somebody tonight and tell them, hey, how you doing? Hey, good to be with you Saturday at the Grove family. Really is uh, just excited to worship with you. Uh, if you're someone who has come back to sur Saturday service because you heard we're going to start having youth now, welcome home, all right? If you're someone who typically goes on Sunday mornings and you're like, you're just checking it out, welcome home as well. I hope you never leave, all right? We're uh, just excited to be with you today. If you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Psalm 116, uh, that's where we're going to be camping out this evening. Uh, I've got a couple questions for you as we get started with our service so to get us into the right mindset. We're talking about uh, gratitude and thankfulness today. You ever walked, about to walk into a store, you've got glass doors, right? And as you're about to walk in, you see someone who's pretty close behind you. And so naturally, as a decent human being, right, you just kind of open the door, you step to the side, and you let them through. And the typical thing that happens is there's a little short exchange. They say thank you, right? And then you'll turn around and they'll, they'll say thank you. And then you turn around and say no problem, and they walk right through. But you ever have it where you hold the door open and they just keep walking? Maybe they're just distracted or just completely oblivious to what's happening. They think you are the automatic door opener, right? And you kind of just walk through, and on your best of days, you'll just kind of let it go and be like, oh, this is interesting. On your worst of days, other things will go through your mind. What about this? What if you're on the freeway, and you've got the, the lane open, right? Just wide open in front of you. You see a car that's starting to merge. Instead of just speeding past, you kind of slow down a little bit and let them through. Again, what typically should happen? They roll down the window, wave, right? Or they wave right in the middle so you can see them through the back window. But on the moments that they don't, you're like, what in the world is going on? Here's my, here's my least favorite one, all right? Again, on the freeway, kind of stop and go traffic. And all of a sudden, you see in one of your side mirrors that there's a motorcycle coming, right? And so you try to do the thing that, that everyone should do and kind of go off and pull off to the side a little bit. And what should happen is the motorcycle driver should go past you, kind of lean right, and kind of give you a wave. Right? What about when they don't do it? It just hurts. You're like, man, that was like a moment we just had, and, and you just messed that up for us. Is it safer for them to keep their hands on the handlebars? Of course, but right, that's not what this is about. It's about thankfulness and gratitude. <laughs> now, of course, these are ridiculously silly examples, but showing thankfulness and gratitude goes a long way, does it not? Amen. Now, the thankfulness and the gratitude that we're talking about tonight, though, it's not just in the simple thank yous that someone uh, people exchange when they hold open a door or in some of those thank you cards that you feel like you need to write. But I'm talking about the posture that one puts themselves in when they take the time to consider exactly what it is that someone has done for them, exactly what it is that it might have cost them or would have taken them to give you what they have given you. And after considering these things, they can't help but simply be overwhelmed with gratitude and with thankfulness. Here's the thing. In this world of more and want that we live in, when we think of essential character uh, traits that someone should have, gratitude and thankfulness are not always high on the list. And yet, as we are going to look at today in Psalm 116, I think this, this, this passage actually argues that for the Christian, 
Gratitude and thankfulness are essential character traits. And I hope that even as we walk through this, we would even be encouraged to ask the question that the psalmist is asking, is how could we not live a life of gratitude? Now, this psalm is a psalm of, again, it's a song of, of thanksgiving, and it's sung by a faithful believer. It's someone who is not just walking aimlessly through the world, but has their eyes set on the Lord and wants to be more like him who is overwhelmed by what the Lord has done, and they can't help but live life with gratitude and thankfulness. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this psalm together, looking at this idea of gratitude and thankfulness, and hoping that the Lord would do a work inside of each of us through it. Does that sound good? All right, let's pray, and we'll hop into this. Father, thank you uh, just for this time that we get to be here together. Lord, we don't, we don't take that for granted. I thank you that you have orchestrated each and every single one of our lives, whether we think it or not, Lord, to be in this room, to open up your word after singing songs of praise and of worship for all that you've done. And God, we know that you're speaking to us. And so, Lord, whatever it is that you want us to see, whatever it is that you want us to know today, God, would you make it so clear? Lord, would we not walk out this room the same way that we walked in, but Lord, would we walk out more like you, challenged and encouraged, Lord? We love you, Jesus. Name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's read Psalm 116 together so we kind of have an idea of what we're walking through, uh, and then we will get into it. Psalm 116 says, I love the Lord, for he has heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. But then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul. For the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will, call up the cup, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Isn't that a great psalm? I'm excited to get through it with you. Point number one, point number one, I'm sorry, part number one of point number one on your notes is this. Faithful believers have a passionate love for the Lord. I mean, right off the bat, in verse one, the psalmist starts off this song simply saying, I love the Lord. Like, I love him. And there's something so beautiful about that simple statement. You know, my wife, uh, Haley, she's a teacher, and so uh, she's at home right now for the summer. Uh, and so when I'm getting ready to uh, go off to work every single day, our uh, 15-month-old son will, will follow me to the front door. He'll walk his chunky little self out to the truck where I'm leaving. And before I can leave, I have to open the door, and he has to get in and pretend to drive for a couple minutes uh, and then I'll pass him off to my wife. I'll close the door. I'll roll the window down, and I'll say, hey, I love you, family, and then I'll drive away. Now, most days, when I say, hey, I love you guys, and I simply just drive away, often what I'm using the, the phrase I love you in is more of a, a, as a, a goodbye or of an e expression of farewell. But every once in a while, there are these days where we'll do that same routine, and as I'm passing my son off to my wife, uh, my heart will just become a little bit overwhelmed. For some reason, the Lord will slow me down, and I'll look at, at my wife, and I'll, I'll just acknowledge and, and, and thank God for the gift that she is to me, that I get to be her husband. I'll look at my son and just thank the Lord that he's given us a, a healthy, healthy kid that we get to raise and so I'll still close my door, I'll, I'll roll down the window, but when I say I love you, I'm not just saying it as an expression of farewell, but I'm actually saying out of this overflow of passion 
out of this overflow of emotion because of gratitude that has settled into my heart. You see, this is the kind of I love the Lord, I love you that the psalmist is using. And we can see that because as soon as he says, I love the Lord, he follows it up with a because. Why does he love the Lord? He loves the Lord, as it says in the rest of verse 1, because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. The psalmist has a passionate love for the Lord because of the way that he has delivered him, because of the way that he has heard him. And he starts this song, this song of thanksgiving, before saying anything else with this beautifully simple statement, I love the Lord. See, when I I was reading this passage over and over again this week, I kept getting stuck on verse 1. I felt, felt challenged to think about right now, right where I'm at in my life. If I were to fill in that line after I love the Lord because, what would I write? See, as we get started with this psalm today, before we go any further, for the believers in this room, I want to ask you this question. To think for just a second, what would you write down after because? What is it for you? Why do you love the Lord? See, as I reflected on it this week, here's what I came up with. I wrote this. I said, I love the Lord God, because you pursued me as a young, misguided wanderer looking for fullness in the world, and you saved me. And you've given me a life I don't deserve and a daily purpose to walk in of which I'm not worthy. Today, that's why I love the Lord. What, for the believers in this room, what is it for you? I want to challenge you to write that down this week. Maybe it's right now, maybe it's later on, and the Lord will reveal that to you and to speak and to pray that to the Lord. This passage continues on naturally into verse 2, and the psalmist says, Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. Second part of number one on your notes is this. The faithful believers, they call on the Lord continuously. Now, the psalmist, he's continuing on really this from verse 1, and he's, he's continuing on with verse 2, and then giving an example of exactly what it is he's going to be thankful for, of this overjoyed exclamation of what, the, of what love that he has for the Lord. And he's reflecting on a time when the Lord saved him out of something, out of a time where he really needed the Lord's help. A pastor by the name of Dan Akins, he writes a commentary on this psalm, and in this exclamation of the verses, he quotes uh, how the message, uh, another translation of the Bible, paraphrases this section stating this on verses 2 through 4. The message says, Death stared me in the face. Hell was hard on my heels. Up against it, I didn't know which way to turn. But like Jonah sinking in a sea that was about to drown him, the psalmist called on the name of the Lord. Let me ask you, have you ever been in a spot like that before? Where you're in a situation where you really, really have no other options. You've explored every single avenue and you're left with nothing. And so you're just forced to go and say, Lord, would you help me? I'm not talking about something that's really inconvenient. I'm talking about a situation where you know that if the Lord doesn't show up, you're not going to make it. You know, I, I know in this church today that there are people in this exact spot You're facing something where the only outcomes that you can come up with, they seem really grim. Whether that's a family that's pulling apart and you feel it's going to fall fall apart completely, or even like the psalmist, maybe it's death itself. And as you face whatever situation it is, I believe we ought to consider what these verses say. See, as the psalmist, he reflects on this near-death experience, he remembers how when he called out to the Lord, simple as this, how the Lord answered. To the psalmist, he doesn't stop here, but in the verses that follows, we see that he, as a faithful believer, he also remembers God's character. In verses 5 through 7, he says, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. You know, the psalmist, he continues this practice of remembrance and specifically pointing out three characters, characteristics of God. He remembers that, the God, that God is gracious. He remembers that God is righteous. And he remembers that God is full of compassion or merciful. In verse 6, he reflects on how he cares for the unwary. What does that mean? He guards those with childlike faith 
who know that they can do nothing apart from the Lord. Dan Aiken again says in his commentary, those who know God best will serve him best. A knowledge of his character and his ways promotes gratitude, and it provides a motivation to trust him and serve him in a way that comes by no other means. See, the psalmist, he's full of gratitude as he remembers and reflects on God's character. And then in verse 7, I love verse 7. You can imagine the psalmist just singing this to himself, this reminder. He says, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. His soul is returning to rest as it is become, as you reflect on all that the Lord has done and his heart is being overcome by gratitude. Man, you see, when we find it hard to rest in this life, I think it comes for one of two reasons, and maybe sometimes both. The first one is want, and the second one is worry. See, when our hearts are full of want, what are we doing? We're actually focusing not on what we do have, but rather on what we don't have. We focus and look at what others have, and our heart starts to idolize and say, man, if I just had what that person had, whether it's money or free time, then everything would become easy. And as we do this, our hearts become more and more uneasy. A similar thing happens when we worry. Like when we think of the future, and the only thing that we can focus on is what we don't know, of the uncertainty that's ahead of us. So, however, as we look at the psalmist, when we have a posture, a heart of gratitude, we are not reflecting on what we don't have or what we don't know, but rather on the opposite, on what we do know and on what we do have. And for the psalmist, he didn't go in and say, God, but you've given me this fortress of protection, and I have all these guards that protect me, and I have money, and I have honey, and I have everything that I could ever need, right? He doesn't say that. But he just it reflects on the fact that he has the Lord and that the Lord answered him. And that in his dark time, the Lord showed up and he reflected on his character, his grace, his compassion, his righteousness, his mercy. So church, are, are you suffering from want today? Are you suffering from worry? Maybe what we need to do is to take heed of what the psalmist did, simply reflecting on what God has already done in your life. And sing out and say, return to rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. Now, for some of you sitting here, as as we read these verses together, you're probably thinking, you know, maybe that was for that, that situation or that circumstance. But if you understood what I was going through, you wouldn't say it was all that easy. You know, as the psalmist sings this song, it's as if he knew others or even he himself one day would have that same thought. Let's verse, look at verses 8 through 11 together. It says, For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said everyone is a liar. And number two on your notes today is this. Faithful believers are thankful in every circumstance. In every single circumstance. That's a pretty hard idea to stomach, isn't it? See, verse 8, though, it highlights just how bad the situation that the psalmist was in. He's, he's not using exaggeration, but he was, in fact, on the brinks of death. That's the kind of situation he was in. His eyes were full of tears. He thought his time was over. His feet were at risk of completely stumbling and walking away from the Lord. But the psalmist chose in this hard situation to do as he ought in verse 10, which was to trust in the Lord. And he continued to trust in the Lord, even while saying, I'm greatly afflicted. It's like he's saying, God, this situation, really, really hard. Not sure how I'm going to make it through this. God, in fact, I see no outcome of which I survive, but God, I trust you. And then verse 11, right? Verse 11 just comes out of nowhere, and it says, in my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. Pretty random verse. But Achan, he comments, in contrast to the God he could trust in his suffering, he also saw another truth more clearly than ever and could shout in his alarm, everyone is a liar. Aiken points out, in their depravity and sinfulness, people are perpetually unreliable. 
God, however, is not. Men may lie, but God only tells the truth. You see, in the midst of a terrible situation, he trusted in the Lord and saw the Lord's goodness. So church, here, here's, here's the truth that we need to pull from this. Even in the worst of situations, there are things that the Lord is going to do that we'll someday be able to look back on and say, God, thank you. And I know that that's a hard idea to really accept because there's a lot of messed up things that happen in this world. But there are. See, in the midst of this song of thanksgiving, the psalmist doesn't leave out the hard things in this life. In fact, he takes the time to reflect on them and to reflect on how God showed up despite them, and it leads his heart to gratitude. Here's a tough application question for us that, to think about this week. What hard thing in your life have you gone through that if you were to reflect back, could find one thing to be thankful to God for? I know that's, that's a tough question, it shouldn't, come to, it, should, it shouldn't lead us to think it's some cheesy question and to act as if things aren't really hard, but it's meant to cause us to reflect on the Lord's provision. For when we do, even in the hardest of times, no matter what it is that we're going through, when our hearts ache and tears are plenty, we can surely find one way that the God showed up and comforted us, and we can give him thanks. To the model, the psalmist, he models this and models a heart that is grounded in gratitude and moved to action because, because of it. Let's look at verses 12 through 14. He says, What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Number three on your notes is this. Faithful believers ask, what shall I return to the Lord? See, the gratitude felt by remembering what someone has done for us does not allow us to ju just sit, but in fact, it, it pushes us, it urges us to action. Here's something we need to hold on to today. Grateful hearts do not forget what has been done for them. They don't. In fact, grateful hearts urge us to act. Aiken talks about in his commentary on this passage how one of the greatest dangers to those who have been saved for many years is losing the wonder of their salvation. We can take for granted what Jesus did for us on the cross, how he bore in his body the wrath of God in our place. It becomes a common thing. The psalmist was acutely aware of this danger, and he provides a helpful remedy to avoid this debilitating spiritual disease. Do you guys catch that? He points out and calls the forgetfulness of what Jesus has done for us a debilitating disease, something that hinders, that stops, that, that doesn't allow us to walk in the faithfulness of which we know we're called to walk. Here's a question, one that has challenged me this week. Do we view the salvation that we have in Christ high enough that the seemingly simple act of even just for a moment forgetting what God has done is not just a momentary slip, but in fact is a, is a debilitating disease that stops us from living in faithfulness? See, like Aiken mentioned, the psalmist was aware of this, though, and he offers a solution. And he asks it in a question. He says, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me. Now for us today, there is nothing that we could possibly give back to the Lord that would make us even before him. The Lord didn't pay us a debt, and then we, we can't now just say, okay, God, I've paid you back for what it is that you've done for me and what you've continued to do. No monetary amount could be written, no treasure sacrificed, no life given in its place. For no money could ever account high enough, no treasures valuable enough, no life valuable enough, to, 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 to make right the sacrifice that was made for us. But what we can do is we can honor the Lord by never forgetting what he has done and by reflecting on the past, present, and future grace that we have because of Jesus. Because the good news of the gospel is not just this, this one moment that we, we had when we first accepted him and then it becomes a past memory. But the truth of the gospel is the daily reminder of who we are before the Lord, a people in dire need of his goodness and salvation, 
and how God did something about that by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, to make a payment that we ourselves, we could not make, and then to rise again three days later so that we too could die to our sin and be rise again alongside him for eternity. Church, we can honor the Lord, as the psalmist puts it, by lifting up the cup of salvation and calling on his name. And when we remember all that the Lord has, did, has done for us by dying on the cross thousands of years ago, we have what we need to honor, to walk in obedience, and to love him deeper today. Church, the beauty, the wonder of the gospel, we can't let it become lethargic in our souls. We cannot become apathetic to the gospel. But brothers and sisters, we must drink the cup of salvation every single day. What that simply means is we need to remember the gospel every single day that we wake up. When you get in God's word, you remember what it is, wherever you're at, whether you're in Genesis or whether you're in Revelation, you remember what the Lord has done, and you drink of it so much so that it can't help but overflow onto those that are around us because a, gr a heart that is full of gratitude for what God has done cannot help but act. An application question for us today. Have you in any way lost the wonder of your salvation? And what has God done in your life that you need to remember today to maybe reignite this wonder? What is that for you? You know, this psalm, it, it seemingly takes quite a dark turn in verse 15. Maybe you noticed it when we first walked through it. Now, to this point, it's really been this joyful song and exclamation of gratitude for all the way that the Lord has preserved the psalmist from death. I mean, he can't help but sing of all that God has done. But then verse 15, right? Let's look at it. It says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Number four on your notes today is this. Faithful believers are thankful in life or death. And you might even think to yourself, how, right? Like, honestly, how? How can one be thankful in death? Sure, we understand in life, but in death. I think the answer we find is that because they know that they're valued by the Lord and their life has purpose regardless. Now, we, we've got to unpack that because this verse doesn't seem to fit the feel of the rest of the psalm, but when we look a little deeper, I think we see it actually does. It does belong. Achan, he points out that the, the same God who can deliver us from death also delivers us through death. Because throughout Achan's commentary on Psalm 116, he brings each point to life by sharing about the story of this incredible sister in Christ. She's from the early 1800s, and her name is Harriet Atwood Newell. And she was born on October 10th, 1793 in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Aiken writes that she had a deep and passionate love for the Lord. She took great delight in referring to God as her Emmanuel, her God with her, her God with us. This intimate love is not surprising as she lost her earthly father on May 8, 1808, when she was 14 years old. Dying of tuberculosis, he left behind a wife and nine children. And even as you read through her journals, though, you see that Harriet believed that the psalmist, that, with the psalmist that God, her father, heard her voice and her pleas for mercy, and he answered. Now, Harriet, she did not have an easy life, and yet, as her journal entries showed, counted with great gratitude all that the Lord had done for her. Every point drawn from this passage we see highlighted in her life so beautifully, especially, though, when we look at verse 15. The point that the Lord values deeply his faithful believers, both in their life and in their death. And it's highlighted in her life. You see, Harriet had a gratefulness for the Lord that led her to action. She couldn't stomach that there are people around the world who still hadn't heard the gospel, who were dying without having a chance to know the same Jesus that had captured her, that had saved her. She was the definition of a faithful believer. Now, Aiken, he writes this following portion about her in this commentary, especially on verse 15, and instead of paraphrase it, I'm just going to read it directly, and it's a little bit longer, but it really highlights from Harriet's own perspective, but also from the perspective of, of her husband, Samuel, uh, just amazing things that her life and how her life shows, verse 15. Aiken wrote, 
it is hard for me to imagine that the death of any saint was more precious to King Jesus than that of Harriet Newell. See, as a teenager newly married, she left her widowed mother and eight brothers and sisters, knowing and accepting that she would never see them again. She was pregnant for most of the four-month journey to India, where she and Samuel would be denied permanent, permanent residence. On the way to the Isle of France, with only her husband at her side, she would deliver a baby girl that they named Harriet, only to watch her baby die five days later. See, less than a month later, taken with both tuberculosis and pneumonia, baby Harriet's mother, Harriet herself, would also die. And yet, as the hour of her death approached, she could write to Ann Judson, her close friend, how dark and mysterious are the ways of providence. But it is well. Everything that God does must be right, for he is a being of infinite wisdom as well as power. Harriet wrote, I think I have enjoyed the light of Emmanuel's countenance and have known joys too great to be expressed. In describing Harriet's death to her mother, Samuel would write, She was by no means alarmed at the idea of death, nor was she melancholy. She was calm, patient, and resigned. During the last week of our voyage, she read through the whole book of Job, and as she afterwards told me, she found sweet relief from every fear in submitting to a sovereign God and could not refrain from shedding tears of joy that God should give her such comfortable views of death and eternity. The enjoyment of God was what she expected and longed to find in heaven. Her mind seemed to repose with comfort and delight on the glorious perfections of Jehovah, her covenant God. She spoke repeatedly of the pleasure she took in dwelling on the character of God. When I asked her if she was not willing to live longer, she replied, Yes, if I could live better than I have ever yet done. But I've had so much experience of the wickedness of my heart that if I should recover, I should expect the remainder of my life to be much like the past. And I long to get rid of the wicked heart and go where I shall sin no more. This thought that death would be a complete deliverance from sin, she repeated many times with great delight. The day, I think, before her death, I, Samuel asked her how her past life appeared to her. She replied, bad enough, but that only makes the grace of Christ appear the more glorious. She then repeated these favorite lines, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my heavenly dress. Midst flaming worlds and these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. On the Sabbath of the 29th of November, the day before her death, Dr. Wallach, a friend of ours from Sermapur, who had lately arrived in the Isle of France, called to see us. After looking at Harriet, he took me aside and told me he thought she could not live through the next day. When I told Harriet that the, what the doctor had said, she raised both hands, clasping them with eagerness, and with an expressive smile on her countenance, exclaimed, Oh, blessed news. Aiken comments, Yes, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Church, when I reflect and I read that this week, I've never heard of Harriet before this week. But I couldn't help but think, I, I hope that my life someday in my life someday, that I could have the same posture towards death or to life that this 19-year-old woman had. This woman who said, I will go wherever it is that you want me to go, even to the ends of the earth, never seeing my family again. And as I read this, I'm convinced that the more we grow in our faith, the more we mature, the more that we understand what Samuel says about Harriet, that the simple enjoyment of God was what she expected and longed to find in heaven. See, Harriet embodied what Paul, while bound in chains, spoke about in his letter to the Philippians in, in, verse, in chapter 1, that for him to live was Christ and to die was gain. That our God in heaven is so good that we can hardly wait to be with him, to spend our eternity with him. So you see, when we take it and we look through those lens, yes, in fact, Verse 15 does fit this psalm. For God can deliver us from death. He can. But he can also deliver us through death if he chose to do so. And, it would mean the, and if it would mean the enjoyment of God, which is the longing of our hearts, would finally be achieved, then even in that, 
there's something to be thankful for. Number five on your notes today as we start to close is this. Faithful believers offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving for all to hear. See, in verses 16 through 19, the psalmist concludes it saying this. He says, truly I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. You see, what we gather at the end of this psalm, church, this song of gratitude, is that gratitude is not an individual experience of the believer. But in fact, this psalm was actually sung corporately. In other words, all together with people. As one would share about what it is that the Lord has done and provided for them, they would sing in gratitude together because of the common grace that they have in Jesus with acts and sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving, which I think is the beauty of gathering together as believers. It's like a halftime. We go through our week, and our weeks are hard, but then we come to halftime, and we get to take a moment and rest, return our souls to rest, to praise the Lord for how, what it is that he has done, and to praise him with gratitude. You know, something that I've waited uh, till the end of the psalm to really point out is that Psalm 116 is actually considered one of the Hallel Psalms. Now, in Hebrew, the word Hallel just means praise. That's where we get the word hallelujah, right? Hallel meaning praise, and Yah, the shortened version of Yahweh, meaning God. Now, the Hallel Psalms refer to Psalms 113 through 118 that were sang during three pilgrim festivals, in particular Passover. And Jews sang these songs every single Passover to celebrate how the Lord had rescued the Egyptians out of Egyptian slavery, the Hebrews out of Egyptian slavery. What's cool is to think about, though, the fact that Jesus himself would have sung these songs in the days leading up to his death as it was a time of Passover when he was crucified. See, the psalm of thanksgiving is a psalm that highlights how the Lord delivered from death. But even as we read in verse 15, how even if the Lord decided not to save, he could deliver through death, and that that's a reason to be thankful and when we consider that Jesus himself would have sung and meditated on this psalm, knowing that he's going to the cross, it brings it to life. Because Jesus would have reflected on the fact that the Lord had delivered him time and time again as you read through the Gospels. You saw how in God's perfect timing, he took Jesus out of situations that could have led to his death because it wasn't his time. And Jesus would have reflected and given thanks. But Jesus also would have reflected and known, knowing that he was going to the cross to die for the sins of all mankind, he would have given thanks to God because he knew that he would deliver him through death. For no more precious in the sight of the Lord than the death of his own son, Jesus. For from it the world was changed forever. So church, wherever you're at today, in your highest of highs or lowest of lows, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have that assurance... No matter the situation, you've got something to be thankful for. I've got something to be thankful for. And as verses 16 through 19 show, how could we not respond together because of that truth just in praise and thanksgiving? So we're about to go into a time of worship together. You know, as we talked about uh, this sermon this last week as a pastoral team, I asked the question to our team, I was like, hey, what does it look like and what are the marks of an individual believer who has gratitude on their hearts? And I asked the same thing for our families. I was like, hey, what would it look like if a family had the mark of gratitude in everything that they did? And then again, we asked, was like, well, what would it look like if a church had a mark of gratitude in the way that they lived together? And someone quickly pointed out, they said, David, we don't really have to imagine that. We just look at our own church. We look at the Grove Community Church, a group of imperfect believers who really does have a mark of gratitude on their lives. That's what it means to, to, to follow Jesus. We see that. It's to just simply be grateful for all that it is that he's done. And so, Lord, so, so church, I'm grateful that we get to walk alongside life together in the, the simplicities of life and the complexities of life where things are really easy, where things are really hard, and we just get to go to the Lord and thanks knowing that the Lord can deliver us 
from death, but he also could deliver us through death. And for that, we'll praise him. I believe that the Grove Community Church, I'm convinced that the Grove Community Church will continue to be a church that does just that. So as we stand together, let us pray, giving praise and thanks to God for all that he has done. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, truly thank you. God, I, I love you, Lord, because of the way that you have saved me, because of the way that you saw me in my spiritual death, Lord, and you've given me life. God, I pray for every single believer in this room today that you would remind them of the salvation that they have in you, that not a day would go by that we do not forget it. God, I pray for the person who has not yet called upon your name. Or would you give them eyes to see, Lord, that you've been pursuing them? God, that even while they were still in their sin, Lord, you sent Jesus to the cross and he went willingly and he died a death that he didn't deserve. And he made a payment that we ourselves could have made and then he rose again three days later. So, Lord, we too could die to our sin and rise again with you. Lord, whatever it is that, that this church is going through, the individual believers in it, would we find gratitude in you? And would it change the way that we live together? Let us sing praises and worship for you are a good God and you have been good to us. In your name we pray, amen. Let's sing and worship together. Amen, amen. Church, will you sing this out with me? What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love. No fate I dread. No fate I dread. I know I am forgiven. The future sure. The price that has been paid. For Jesus went and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised. Complete still my 
Come on. Still my lips shall repeat it, not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Church, we thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us tonight. Um, we have giving boxes on the way out. Uh, if you are new, we would love to meet you over at Guest Central. And if you're in need of prayer, we'll have prayer partners up in the front. We thank you so much and have a great rest of your evening.